Okay, so thank you everybody for being here. So let's continue after the break. Try to make it fast and painless. So how does this work? Ah, okay. So yeah, so I'd like to talk today about traceability requirements and why we also should consider this, or shall, we're talking requirements, shall consider this for software. Um, I'm a safety person, um, so please excuse me if I'm sometimes a little bit strange. Um, so I'd really like to show you what's the issue with having no traceability in software or no, no requirements um, and why we need oops, and why we need this. Um, Inten the intentions of why to have documentation and evidences um, yeah, documented and give you a glimpse into the upcoming SPD safety model that hopefully helps you with that um, to set up and maintain. So let's, let, let's talk a little bit of history. <clears throat> Back then when we started to think about safety it was based on pure mechanics. We had for example, these big steam trains, um, the safety was in the nuts and in the bolts and in the construction, how these worked together, how these were sturdy and big and reliable enough in the steel that was there to be safe. And actually, one of the basics to that was also that everything you had in there was uh, standardized and identifiable. So I have this still from my, when I started to work. So in here you find every kind of combination of measures to identify a screw, uh, dimensions, what tool to use, uh, what uh, torque to apply when you um, fix a screw. So Serial, uh, you have serial numbers, you have everything standardized how to identify things. And when you need a screw, so you know, this is the, the screw itself is not the specification of the screw. The, screw the, the dimensions are described in a specific way. You can verify it easily enough. The, dimension, the dimensions are on the box. The serial number is on the box. When you buy this in the shop, you have these little measuring things where you can make it really sure that you have um, the screw that you wanted to have. When you're in your box at home, it's also pretty easy to identify. You have these little things, just you know, like this. I know exactly which size this is. So it's it's pretty standardized. It's not something in between. And. All this information that we have, it's really, it give, gives us the manufacturing information. Where does it come from? If something breaks, maybe the whole lot or the whole build is affected, you know? So you can trace things back in mechanics pretty easily by standardization, by having serial numbers, by having uh, bombs, a bill of materials. This is nothing new to engineering of how, which things you put into your final systems, what were the dimensions you have in your construction documentation, why you decided to have this, and you have a list of everything and where it came from. And I don't want to do finger pointing, but I think this is a, an accident at least the Europeans still have in their mind, the big uh, crash in, in Eschede. Um, where there were several hundred, uh, no, there were around 100 dead, a lot of people injured. It was a real shock to us German engineers that something like our big ice trains can break and that break that fatally. And actually the only way to, to get over this and to decide what could we have done better was really to analyze what was the material, what were the dimensions, look at the disastrous uh, debris and, and check what really happened. Um, what were the response um, reactions? How could we get better? And based on this information, we were able to come up with, yeah, improved um, construction of the wheels, improved maintenance routines, improved um, of, um, uh, response um, and emergency ways. So this is something that we also should consider for software. So once something happens, really going to the source code 
might not help us in the end. So this is a question I really like to ask you when it comes to your life. What would you trust more? A screw where you exactly knew where it came from, exactly know, know its tensile strength, its material, its dimensions, the tools you need to use um, to assemble it, or would you trust something that you find, found on, on GitHub and just because it's openly available, you would use. So back to today. We don't have pure mechanics anymore. So everything I said about mechanics, it's still true. But we have electrical systems and we have software. We have loads and loads of software. And we need to trust the software the same way we trust the mechanics these days. So functional safety can really add some value to that. So I won't get into that. Um, Philip already opened that track explaining what is functional safety. And yeah, safety is a system property. Safety is the complete train with its braking systems, but it's also the trust that you have in each screw, in each bolt. And for software, this translates into you need to have a trust in each, each piece of software. You can have the most beautiful software. If one piece is crap, it will give you the incident. So, and from a functional uh, safety point of view, that means um, you need to have a concept that builds your a software that is sturdy enough, but you also need to have the process and the documentation and the evidences to show people that this is really what you have intended to have. So you need to have the intentions and you need to have the evidence that you have implemented it as intended. Um, yeah, usually there is a specific way to, to capture all this. This is documented in several safety standards. Um, in the end, whatever standard you're looking into it, it always asks you for the same stuff. Unique IDs, traceability, evidences, evidence of completeness, archiving of things. So it's, it's whatever the flavor that is the, the stuff that comes out there. And the big challenge on that is not creating this once and then forgetting about it somewhere in your archive. The big challenge is creating this consistently and then keeping it up to date throughout the life cycle. So as just for overview, <laughs> you will, for functional safety, you usually create loads and loads of documentation. You have on the one hand side, your plans, based on that, you, cre you create your a safe system, uh, you do analysis based on, your, um, on your, based on your system, you have the planning documents, safety plan, configuration management plan, whatever plan, you have your code, you have your test evidences, you have your assessment evidences, so you have a lot of stuff. Thankfully, this stuff is not an amorphous blob, it's in relation to each other, so everything depends on a lot of other things. And as many people see the V model as a sequence of doom, <laughs> don't, don't, please don't look at it as a sequence model. Look at it as a knowledge model that you describe what you want to have, the assumptions that you made of what you need, and the, the way you want to reach this. And these days, the, uh, all these pieces of knowledge, all this information is captured in different types of documents. You have more or less always some kind of plans, process guidelines, you have requirements, and you have all your test results, tests, analysis results, assessment results, all that. And all that stuff is documented in its own system. You have your life cycle systems, you have your um, repositories for your code, you have some system that creates you the dashboards for your management. You might have a, it might be very modern and you might have a wiki, but it's all living in its own space. So really keeping this stuff up to date and in relation to each other so that your documentation of what you want to do is really up to date 
what's in the code and that your tests are up to date not only with the code, that's usually in development not the big issue, but that they are, they are up to date with what's expected of the code. That's really, at the moment, the hardest thing to keep up to date. And any guesses what's the number one tool at the moment is to document this, to keep the traceability up between all the words? It's, my, it's Excel. And usually this documentation comes with a very uh, interesting name, a draft that is final, that has a version number that for sure is not the same version number you find in the document. And when you look into the document and start looking for the, the um, evidences, for the work products, for the code that's referenced in there, you will find that it's not up to date because it's a pain keeping this up to date manually. And each company, each project has its own way of doing things, so you can't exchange it and know by just having it uh, where to find something. You can't import, export, you can't use this for really trace to establish traceability between projects. It's impossible. So why should we look into SPDX for that? And um, just by reading through, let's say, the first thing that comes up when you look for SPDX and what SPDX is supposed to do, it already ticks a lot of boxes. Not, we don't, we don't, you don't even need to think deeper into what to, to add to SPDX for safety. It already ticks a lot of boxes. It tells you um, we have a way to describe what's in a release. We have a way, uh, a way to describe where it comes from, about the author, about the licenses, about the copyright, um, about relationships between um, um, or dependencies between projects. It gives you really already a lot of information. So that's where we started to look into having a safety profile for it. And when you just look at the simplified version of the V model and say it's not a sequence, it's a knowledge model, you see you can already use existing SPDX relationships to describe the dependencies within your project. And um, now with, uh, if you look into the, um, the models for SPDX 3.0, you will find there's a lot of stuff there that we already need. Um, you can find the models on GitHub under the little QR codes, so no, no, don't worry that you can't read it. And if you look, for example, what we are now planning to do in the Cepher project, we have a structure. This is just looking at the requirements management and the, requ the relation of planning to requirements to code. Uh, we can set up a model based on these relationships, or we can, uh, yeah, the traceability that we have in the tooling translates into these SPDX relationships. And if you look a little bit deeper into that, um, you can really see um, you have a safety plan that describes what should be done for requirements management, what should be done for verification. Um, it translates also to um, what should be in the coding guidelines. So safety plan will say, hey, we need some coding guideline. We need to agree on how to code. And the coding guideline influences how the code is written. The, re the requirements influence what is written in the code. So everything has an ancestor or a child relationship. Um, and this really works through the complete life cycle of a system or of a project. So including at the end also the evidences that really show this is the evidence that it complies with requirements that it complies with coding guidelines for this release of the code. Um, yeah, and the beauty of that really is once you find an issue, you don't need to start guesswork. You don't need to start calling people, having a shout out on three different mailing lists to get the right people into the room that might know where to look into the uh, real source of this issue. You really have a way to follow these relationships back to its possible source. So from the build, back to the source code, back to coding guidelines and requirements. 
and really identify what was the issue. Do I have a wrong requirement? Do I have coding guidelines that destroy my functionality? Uh, do I have a simple coding error? Usually it's not the code, it's usually the requirement that's wrong. So, yeah. And it's really, when you think about, um, I want these pieces of information that come into my project just to decide, is this really what I want? Is um, this project, this piece of code, um, performing as I want to have it? You can really look into uh, the S-bombs that can be then created by the project. It's not something that somebody in the inbound um, process department needs to do and then just assume by reading code that they might not understand what something does. You get information about what's in there, how is it structured, what's, what was the intention of it. Thank you. And yeah, you can really reuse all of these pieces of information to document what finally gets deployed in your system. So that's the big goal coming from Excel to a, 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 a standardized lifecycle model with SPDX. Um, this is just the, the summary I've already told you about. You can standardize your impact analysis. Uh, you don't, uh, yeah, you have uh, a, a standardized exchange format between the projects for the safety cases. You have reproducible results, it's not depending on who you just get on the phone. And it's a formal way to demonstrate completeness, so you don't need to start gathering all your evidences manually across different tools. So just for remembering, it can really cover the whole V model. And if you would like to know more about it or contribute, we meet each Friday evening, so Friday evening in European time, and yeah, that's it, thank you. And are there any questions? Yeah, where's the, bo the, where's the box? Thank you. Um, I, I'm wondering from a practical perspective, uh, you had code at the center of those uh, slides. Uh, what are you? tracking exactly, like what's the granularity? Are you tracking releases, individual patches, so, or how do you use it? Really source code, so source code with um, relation to say this is a function, how this fun what this function should do is described in this requirement or in this interface specification. But if it changes over time or from release to yeah, next, if it you know if it changes over time, you will adapt your documentation anyway. So even now, without thinking about high-level requirements, you will update uh, your interface specification. You will update the docs so that everybody that uses it knows that maybe I have a new parameter in this interface, or that I have a a new uh, a type in this interface, or that this interface has now a new functionality somewhere in the back. You will document this anyway. And I don't expect, at least not for the near future, that a developer or maintainer will care about high-level requirements. This, on the short term, will be a task for a different group really going over um, changes in a regular basis and say, hey, what does this mean on a high level for us? But uh, the intention of the model is really to track everything down from, let's say, a function level to an interface specification or design to the docs and then to a higher level document that is then more or less the interface of this. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, yeah, all this sounds really amazing, and I think it's definitely something that as new systems are developed, like you can really take this approach from the ground up. Um, I guess I, I want to get your thoughts on what existing systems can do, if there's ways to iteratively take portions of this and replace like that Excel spreadsheet, uh, that type of thing, and if you have any recommendations 
for guidance on that uh, for people that have existing systems um, they want to adopt so, this with. Yeah, so my recommendation is always don't eat the full burger in one bite. Um, look into what is the section that's most important to you for applying this. It could be the one the most stable, so you don't need to iterate too often or using a new system, or it might be the most changing one because you really want to keep track in this way. So I would really say, okay, identify a part of your system, your project, where you want to roll this out, play around with it at the moment, give us feedback, please, <laughs> and yeah, just go with it. But yeah, piece by piece. Also, you know, we, we don't roll this out over each project from the Cephal point of view. We roll this now slowly out using our requirements management tool. Um, Luigi is implementing it in Bezel so that also what's documented in Bezel can generate this. So it's really piece by piece and it's not a big bunch at all. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm just, yeah, I think we're, one more question, I guess, and I'm just, um, in terms of the safety profile and the evidence, what do you see as the benefits by having this stuff automated from the point of view of working uh, with the ecosystem? So the benefit is it's much less pain because having it automated means you don't need to think about it. Um, it's something that just, it, it does not just happen, but it ju it's, it's not like you need to manually edit something. You just type it down, your, your tooling will take care of it, mm -hmm. and it, it's making things much more reproducible, much more sustainable, much more maintainable. Do you think the assessors will assess? Um, yeah. Go. So I, I don't have any official information, but you know, I have many friends still working as assessors, and if I uh, pitch this to them, they like it. They just want to see how it uh, works out and who will ad uh, adapt it. And then they, oh, but you know, the SPTX tooling then also needs to go through a quality um, evaluation. But yeah, that's, we need to trust our tooling, right? That's just what it is. Okay. Any last questions? Okay. Well, thanks, Nicole. Thank you.